far, we have seen that a fluid, typically, is a material, an idealized material, which typically has two differences, two main differences in terms of the constitutive equations with respect to solids. The stresses, instead of depending on the strains, depend on the rate of the strains. So to generate the stresses, it's not enough to produce strains. It's necessary to produce strains in an enough fast way, in a speed way, in a, in a fast way, produce rate of strains. And these stresses, the, this rate of strains affect the value of the stresses, typically in terms of strength coefficients, which are now called viscosities. A fluid with no viscosity is not a fluid with no stress. It's a fluid with just pressure. This pressure can be, if the fluid is at rest, a thermodynamic, uh, a hydrostatic pressure, is the fluid, in some cases, is uh, called the, the, uh, the mean pressure that is equal to the uh, hydrostatic pressure, and in the more general case, we have another term, which is the thermodynamic pressure. And this is the second difference of a fluid with respect to a solid. The stresses have the component of, one component we refer, which contains the, hydro, the thermodynamic pressure. So let's also have a look on, into the problem of, or, or into the issue of the stress power and the energy balance. You remember that, we just studied that in chapter five. We said that the mechanical power that we entered into the medium, which was the power, that means the work per unit of time, due to the body forces, to the traction forces, the external world, was spent into two things. One, uh, in producing a variation of the, that term, which is identification of the kinetic energy, and that term here, that was the stress power. And of course, this is still whole for any continuum mechanics, any continuum medium. So this also holds for uh, fluids. Okay. So this stress power, we just identified it as that part of the mechanical power that we enter into our medium which is not spent in introduced the in, in increase or decrease the kinetic energy. So everything that doesn't go to increase the kinetic energy increases something else, which is produced a work per unit of time due to deformation, and that is what we call the stress power. Okay, so let's examine that in the case of a fluid. Okay? Stress power. That's the definition that then we split the, the rate of strains as the mean, as the spherical part and the deviatonic part, and we split the stresses into the spherical part in the case of the mean stress and the deviatonic stresses. We now express this, this product, uh, taking into account this decomposition, make operation, take into account that one times one, double dot one, is equal to three, it's just a trace of one, which is three. We just account, uh, take into account that the D prime is a deviatoric uh, uh, tensor whose trace, by definition, the trace of any deviatoric tensor is zero. So we also do the same apply to that, but after application, we take that sigma times d can be explained in that way. For one side, the product of the thermodynamic pressure, thermodynamic pressure, the thermodynamic pressure, not the mean pressure, times the trace of d plus one term, which looks like that, k times the square of d plus two, two mu d prime d prime. You remember, when we talk about stress power in elasticity, we obtain an, an expression which would look like that, with the only difference that instead of d, we had strains. And in k and mu, instead of being viscosity, where this was the, young, the bulk modulus and this the shear modulus. Here, they are the bulk viscosity and that shear viscosity. Okay? But in t on top of what happened in solids, there is this part here. Why is this part here? Remember, we talked that 
this is not a, a, a function of a state, so this is not energy. In general, this is not recoverable, so uh, uh, there is, it's not uh, involves something that in a in a closed cycle can be recovered. In general, this is not a state function, but this part here which we will term WR, R standing for recover all, it can be proven essentially by experience that it's essentially recoverable. So this is, so to speak, something that uh, in, in a closed cycle, in a closed cycle, can be reversed with no loss. Okay, that's a function of a state. Okay. Whereas this part here, this part here, this is something that, in principle, is dissipative. So we cannot recover that. It means something that is lost forever. Whenever this term is produced, it's not recoverable. That's what. So that's why we call this that dissipative part of the stress power, and we call that WD for dissipative. Here, R is for recoverable, and these two is for convenience. Okay, so. Finally, you can say that the stress power can be split into the recoverable part with that expression and the easy part with that expression. Okay? But now we realize that the recoverable part is just the product, the recoverable part with just that, is just the problem of P times D. You multiply this P times 1 and trace the D, trace of D, then this part understood as explaining this hydrostatic stress state as sigma r, a tensor, multiplying by d, the multiplication of this part times d produces what we call the, reco the recoverable part of the stress power. And the multiplication of all that times d produces what we call the dissipative po power. So by extension, we say, well, then we can say that the stresses have two parts. When such that when applied to the stress power, so when multiplied them to the to the rate of the strains, the first part produces something which is some power which is recoverable, and the second part something which is non recoverable, dissipative. So that is why we call this the recoverable part of the stresses, and this the dissipative part of the stress. In other words thing that in a fluid the part of the stresses due to pressure to pressure to thermodynamic pressure okay this is recoverable it's like in an elastic <coughs> material but the part of the stresses the fact that you have viscosity produces something that cannot be recovered which is dissipated okay and this is what is emphasized here so the stress power has a recoverable part, which is essentially the product or the part produced by the pre pressure part multiplied by the rate of the strains, and a dissipative part, which is the rest multiplied by the time of the strains, which can be written in that way. Curiously enough, in an incompressible fluid, what happens in incompressible fluid? Divergence, the, the now, again, it's something that we examine many times. Eh? It's a question that we examine many times. In a compressible fluid, look at this equation. This is zero. So for the continuity equation, the divergence is zero. Okay? If the divergence is zero, that means that the trace of D, which is divergence, is zero. So in an incompressible, that's something that we already done several times. In an incompressible fluid, trace of D always is zero. Okay? So now applying that to that situation. We see that in a compressible fluid, that term, trace of D, is zero. So the recoverable part of an incompressible fluid, of the stress power, the recoverable part of the stress power in an incompressible fluid, is zero. Okay? <coughs> and that means that that's something, no, that's why it is important, because, I mean, I told you very many times, our fluid by excellence is water which is incompressible okay so if there is some dissipation in water is due just to the viscosity but 
I can anticipate though. Since water is essentially non viscous, sun water is typically non dissipative. So, energy that we give to water always is recovered in some way. If you give energy to water, water has some stress power, of course, of course. But, but typically, all energy that we give to water, for instance, giving potential energy, right? That then we just evacuate the, to the spillway the reservoir. This water falls. It gains kinetic energy and also deforms. It gains some deformation, some stress power. But it's the, 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 this energy, this power that we have given to this water, it's always recoverable. That's why sometimes in, in engineering uh, we can use power and store the energy of power. You know this, uh, this uh, reversible, reversible uh, uh, hydro, uh, hydraulic stations? What do they do in reservoirs? In reservoirs, what they do is just they just produce energy to the turbines and so like that. But same of this energy is used in, in the valley, in the valley consumption time of the day, when this energy is not demanded by the market, they use this energy just to pump up to other upper or, or to the reservoir again and then produce produce uh, just store this energy for another time when demanding the demanding of water is higher. That is what is called the reversible uh, hydroelectric uh, central stations. Uh, that is what the central reversible is called. Why? Because in the deformation process, in, in the process, we don't lose energy. So it's, so to speak, for free. The energy that we use to pump the water up will be recovered almost 100% just when we just uh, allow them to flow again through the turbines. If this was oil, it would be a very bad business. That's the, that's the way. This kind of things is something that uh, uh, we have to incorporate into our background. So finally, is what I said. Okay, the derivative, the, the recoverable part of the power is an exact differential, and then that is a, is a, uh, this gives rise to uh, 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 that this recoverable part of work is uh, fully recoverable under a cycle like that. The other part, which is the reverse, the the, the dissipative part of the power, is that, and that. Now I won't prove it, but now again it can be proven that this part is dissipative, dissipative and again, look, the second principle of thermodynamics proves that this dissipation has always to be greater than zero. Is this is related to the entropy, and since the entropy has to be greater because than zero, so finally I, go, I won't go into details, but uh, that is something that can be assumed. So this is always ingredient or equal to zero. And this comes out from the second principle of thermodynamics. Again, this principle of thermodynamics that don't say exactly what is what, but it says what can be or what cannot be. That means that a process with negative, negative, uh, irrecoverable part of the dissipation, so this term being negative, is not possible. Moreover, if that is equal to zero, then necessarily this is only equal to zero when the case of the rate of strain is equal to zero. So when there is typically no velocity, a truth at rest. What are the consequences of that? Well, there are consequences of that. If this is always equal to zero, we can produce, imagine that we produce in that fluid, a, a, a certain deformation such that this term is zero. So that the, the, the differential part, the, the aspheric, the deviatonic part of the rate of the strain is equal to zero. And this equation is still, is, is still holds. So we would find in that case that this factor, which is, should be the same letter by the way, it's not here, but should be the same letter, the, the uh, bull viscosity multiplied by the square of the trace of D has to be 
greater than zero, trace of d being different from zero. What is the consequence of that? That this k, the bulk modulus, has to be positive. So that is again the role of the second principle of thermodynamics. It says what are the limitations of the physical parameter of our models. We cannot formulate a fluid with a physical parameter or the physical value for the for the bulk viscosity, which is negative. It's not possible. It's unphysical. Maybe we can idealize that, but there is no, in a physical reality, there is no possibility for a fluid of having a negative value of the uh, bulk viscosity. On the other way around, imagine now that you have the same fluid, but now we produce a motion in which this part is zero and this part is different. It's not. So look that, again, this is a double dot product of a tensor times itself. This is always positive. So if this is always positive and the result has to be positive, what can we say? That the viscosity, the, she the shear viscosity mu, is always positive. So finally, we find some limitation in the viscosity values that we have to use for characterizing our Newtonian fluids. The bulk viscosity has to be greater than zero. That means the lambda plus two thirds of mu greater than zero. And mu itself is greater than zero. That means that lambda can be negative. Eh? Lambda can be negative. But not more, not more negative than minus two thirds of mu. Because then this would be zero. In fact, Lambda sometimes is taking negative, sometimes is taking equal to minus two thirds of mu. Why? Because then k is equal to zero, and that is the, ca is the case that we mentioned before, the Stokes condition, which simplifies the equations. Okay? And the viscosity, that's the main viscosity of a fluid. That is the main viscosity of a fluid. That's the responsible of the viscosity of the fluid. It's always positive. No can never talk about the never viscosity of a fluid. Okay, so that's it. Now we have defined something that is not that different of what we see for fluids, for the most general type of fluids we're going to study, which are the Newtonian fluids. Insist, differences of that is that we have a term of pressure, thermodynamic pressure, and then we have three different concepts of pressures, thermodynamic, hydrostatic, and mean pressure. The constitutive equation is similar to the one of solids, but changing the concept of a strain by rate of strain. The concept of Lambert parameters by um, viscosities. And that famous term that appears here, which is the pressure. And with that, now we are going to do the same that we did in solids. What did you do in solids in elasticity? First, we formulated the constitutive equation, and we see if we were able to solve the, the uh, partial differential equation problems. That's, and then we solve the solid mechanic problems with these examples, with all examples for elastic problems. Now, next chapter is what we are going to do, fluid mechanics. We are considered a continuum medium, which is a fluid, which is ruled by the general laws, conservation laws of the continuum medium, plus a specific constitutive equation, which is that one. And we will see that with that, we can already solve real problems in fluids. And arrive to equations that you problem have been told in hydraulics or in several of the courses that you have taken. But now we see that we can solve the partial differential equations for some. We can arrive to same equations, differential equations, which either can be solved in simpler cases, which is what we do, or they have to be solved in by numerical methods. That's what we do when we use a, 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 a computer code for that, to find the element code.